All right, welcome back. This is the fourth and final part of lecture one about heat. Remember, there's a whole second lecture about heat. This is a big topic uh, in our first module of the course. Now, we've learned a lot of things here about what can happen to radiation when it passes through an object or when it is absorbed by an object or scattered by an object, which means now we can actually talk about Earth's radiation budget which I have written there in a goofy font because it kind of sounds spooky or something like that. You know, like a swamp monster created by radiation or something. But that's not where we're going with any of this. I mean, that's radioactivity. That's about, you know, broken atoms that were, you know, like uranium and so on. We're talking here about radiation, just the business of energy being transported in the form of waves in the electromagnetic field around you. Now... We're gonna. I, I do want to focus for a moment on that word budget. Survivors of ATS at EVS 105, the climate change course, knows that we know that we've talked about budgets a lot. Where we were talking about like how you keep track of how much energy is gained or lost as a way of deciding how the temperature is going to change, and that's going to be where we're going to go here. Now, in the context of 105, we were mostly doing that in about climate change. You know, how could we tell that the planet was gaining energy or losing energy? Here, this is going to be more about um, the daily changes, how we decide how temp is temperature going to be increasing at different times of the day or temperature going to be decreasing. Now, in order to do this, again, we're going to be sorting out the radiation in terms of long-wave radiation that is emitted by things with terrestrial temperatures like the surface of the Earth or clouds or something like that. And short-wave radiation which is primarily in the form of visible light and ultraviolet radiation that, uh, you know, this shortwave radiation comes from the sun. So let's focus on first uh, the daytime side of this graph. And you have a very similar di diagram in your book. Shortwave radiation from the sun makes it through 94 million miles of cold, dead space and encounters the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And it's shortwave radiation, and as we've discussed before, by and large, the atmosphere is transparent to shortwave radiation. By and large, the gases of the Earth's atmosphere transmit shortwave radiation rather than absorb it or scatter it or whatever. So most of that shortwave radiation is going to just be transmitted uh, through the atmosphere to the surface, but not all of it. For example, one type of shortwave radiation is ultraviolet radiation, and you already know that even though there aren't that many ozone molecules in the Earth's atmosphere, they're really good at absorbing shortwave radiation. So that's part of the shortwave radiation that won't have made it all the way to the ground. It'll have been absorbed by ozone. Clouds are really good at reflecting shortwave radiation back up into space. So that is uh, energy that will have been transported 94 million miles from the sun to the top of the Earth's atmosphere. It's going to hit a cloud and reflect back out into space without ever having warmed up the Earth in any way. There'll be some loss of shortwave radiation just by uh, reflection by dust and aerosols in the Earth's atmosphere. There's a little bit of absorption by some of the other trace gases in the Earth's atmosphere and so on. But by and large, most of that shortwave radiation that has started off at the top of the Earth's atmosphere will have made it all the way to the ground. Now, we're going to have a symbol for that. The quantity of radiation, of shortwave radiation that makes it all the way to the ground is going to be a number that we're going to call SW down, or short wave down. Okay, this is radiation. If we had an instrument here at the surface of the Earth, we could measure how much energy at any given time is making it to the surface of the Earth. That's short wave down, SW down. But that's not really the amount of... That, that radiation would be used to heat the surface of the Earth, but not all of it. Because the surface of the Earth also reflects some short wave radiation, and reflecting radiation doesn't change the temperature of the object doing the reflecting. So, based on the, uh, the, how reflective the surface is, some of this radiation is going to be reflected back up into this, uh, let's use the right word, based on the albedo of the surface of the Earth. Some of that radiation is going to be reflected upward, and we're going to use the symbol SW up, or short wave up, to describe the amount of radiation that gets reflected up. So, the total amount of radiation that's actually being used to change the temperature of the surface of the Earth is actually, well, at least in terms of the shortwave radiation, is going to be the difference between shortwave down and shortwave up. So we'll have like this net shortwave that is the difference between the amount that is coming down and the amount that's going up. That is actually energy that is being used to increase the temperature of the surface of the Earth. Of course, it only happens during the day. At night, there's not a meteorologically meaningful amount of shortwave radiation. It all comes from the sun. At night, yeah, I suppose there's a small amount of shortwave radiation, 
that is in the terms of like what's been reflected in terms of moonlight and starlight and so on, but that doesn't really have any meteorological impact. So we only really worry about shortwave up and shortwave down and therefore the net shortwave radiation during the day. Now, in the second of these two lectures, big lectures about heat, we're going to actually talk quite a bit about what determines the amount of shortwave down that reaches the surface of the Earth. It's going to have to do with things like the angle of the sun, the latitude you're at, the, the, the length of daylight that you're experiencing on the day, what day of the year it is, and so on. We'll spend quite a bit of time about that kind of stuff in the second lecture of this series. But for now, let's also talk about what's going to happen at night. Now, both day and night, the surface of the Earth emits long-wave radiation. The surface of the Earth is made of matter. Part of what it means to be matter is we are emitting radiation. At the temperature that is the surface of the Earth, that's going to be long-wave radiation, according to Wien's law. So the surface of the Earth is emitting radiation upward. It's long-wave radiation, and the symbol that we're going to use for how much that is is going to be LW up for long wave up. There are instruments we can use and we point them at the ground and we measure how much long wave radiation is coming up out of the ground and heading back up into space. Now, that long wave radiation, that is energy we are losing down here at the surface of the Earth. That emitting of radiation lowers the temperature of the Earth. So that is long wave radiation that is kind of working to cool the Earth and it's headed out through the atmosphere out toward space and some of it does make it to space if it is at a particular wavelength that we call the atmospheric window. Now this is a tricky concept. The atmospheric window is not a place, it's not a thing, it is a range of wavelengths. And the exact number of like how, how you know, what, what's the range of wavelengths is not so important. But the idea is a little bit of the long wave radiation that the Earth's surface emits is in a range of wavelengths that as it happens, nothing in the Earth's atmosphere is good at absorbing. Not the nitrogen, not the oxygen, not the ozone, not the carbon dioxide, not the water vapor, anything. So if the particular photon of long wave radiation that the surface just emitted happens to be in that range of wavelengths, it'll just get transmitted through the Earth's atmosphere and out to space. Okay, that's heat that's just lost. Great. Okay, that's kind of what we want. We're gaining energy from the sun, but we're losing energy back to space. We should be keeping the temperature of the Earth constant. But by and large, that's not what happens. Most of the long wave radiation that is emitted upward by the surface of the Earth, that long wave up, is actually in the form of photons of energy that are in, associated with wavelengths that some of the gases in the Earth's atmosphere are actually great at absorbing. The so-called greenhouse gases, mostly carbon dioxide, but also to a lesser extent water vapor, methane, and things like that, also clouds, turn out to be really good at absorbing long wave radiation. So radiation that the surface of the Earth emits ends up getting absorbed by gases between the surface of the Earth and space. Therefore, that is heat that did not get away. It was absorbed by those gases along the way. Mostly carbon dioxide, water vapor, and methane, as I said. And the so-called greenhouse gases themselves are made of matter, right? They're molecules and so on. And part of what it means to be matter is you emit radiation well, the greenhouse gases are at terrestrial temperatures, so they're going to be, by Wien's law, emitting radiation at long wavelengths. Yeah, some of that radiation they emit happens to be emitted in the direction of up, and that radiation will make it out into space. But actually, a lot of it will be also emitted downward, and that radiation will come back down to the surface of the Earth. In fact, we can measure it. If you're in the ATS-114 lab, you will measure it, or at least work with measurements of it. And that figure, we're going to call that LW down. That is long wave radiation coming down from the sky. It was emitted by the greenhouse gases and clouds. And that's heat we're getting back. That is heat that is warming the surface of the Earth again. It's, it's heat that the surface of the Earth gave off. It wasn't reflected by clouds or reflected by greenhouse gases. That's the wrong way to think about it. It is that the clouds and the greenhouse gases absorbed that heat, and then they themselves gave off heat, back down towards the ground. This is what is so-called the greenhouse effect. Now we're going to actually later in the course talk more about greenhouse effect and if you're a survivor of ATS EVS 105 you've learned a little, so much about the greenhouse effect. But notice that the role of these greenhouse gases is to keep the surface of the earth warmer than it would otherwise be. This is the greenhouse effect. If those greenhouse gases weren't there emitting radiation back down towards the surface of the earth the temperature of the earth would be quite a bit colder. In fact without the greenhouse effect 
life wouldn't be possible on Earth because the Earth would be cold. We're far enough away from the sun that the Earth would actually be permanently frozen if it weren't for the greenhouse effect. That doesn't mean that there isn't also the so-called enhanced greenhouse effect that's a problem caused by humans, but we'll get there. But just like with the case with shortwave radiation, so we emitted a certain amount of long-wave radiation and we got a certain amount of long-wave radiation back from the sky, it's really the difference between those two that matters. Are we emitting more long-wave radiation or are we getting more radi long-wave radiation back from the sky? The net long-wave radiation, LW net, then is the difference between the amount of long-wave radiation we are emitting and the amount of long, that's long-wave up, and the amount of long-wave radiation coming back from the sky and the, from the greenhouse gases and clouds, long-wave down. In fact, for our total energy budget, it's actually the difference between uh, the short wave and the long wave net. So our total radiation budget net would then be the difference between the short wave and the long wave. By the way, you notice I have all these minus signs in here. Don't get bogged down with the signs on this. Any of these terms could be defined so that positive was emitting radiation or positive could be uh, defined as, as absorbing radiation. Let's not worry about the signs here. It's more the idea where we're saying, oh, I see. We have to take into account both the short wave radiation that is coming in and the short wave radiation that's going out, and also come to think of it, the long wave radiation that's coming in and the long wave radiation that's going out. Overall, though, of course, if we are gaining more radi heat from ra the form of radiation than we are losing, the temperature is going to go up. And if we are losing more radiation uh, than we are gaining, then the temperature is going to go down. Now, a key aspect of this to notice is how clouds figured into this several different ways. The business of the role of clouds is actually a major challenge in atmospheric sciences because clouds play two competing roles in the Earth's atmosphere. During the day, when there's shortwave radiation coming from the sun, clouds actually work to help keep the planet cool. The shortwave from the radiation from the sun hits those clouds and is mostly reflected because the clouds have a high albedo and that is radiation that never made it to the surface of the Earth and did not act to warm the planet up. So during the day, clouds are undoubtedly working to keep the planet cool. But both day and night, clouds also have this role in the greenhouse effect. Clouds are really, really good at absorbing long-wave radiation. So when the surface of the Earth emits long-wave radiation, the clouds absorb it, and clouds themselves are made of matter, and they emit long-wave radiation back down to the surface of the Earth. So both day and night, clouds have a role that is about keeping the planet warmer. Folks who camp a lot definitely know this. If it is a clear night when you're out camping, it always gets a lot colder at night. If it's a cloudy night, the, 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 it just doesn't get as cold. And it's because the clouds are acting, a good way to think about it is the clouds are acting like a blanket. They are, blankets aren't warm. Blankets keep you warm by keeping your own heat from getting away, and that's very much what clouds are doing, too. Our own heat from the surface of the Earth is being absorbed by the clouds, and then the clouds themselves emit the heat back down to the ground. Hmm. The role of clouds is actually incredibly complicated. In fact, for a long time, uh, in like the 90s and the early 2000s, it was one of the major challenges that NASA and the NS National Science Foundation and so on were funding researchers to work on was, what is the net role of clouds? Are clouds working to keep the planet warmer or colder overall? And it turns out it's pretty close to even. Okay, But that's actually going to turn out, as you're going to see several modules from now when we actually do the human impact on climate, you're going to start finding out, oh boy, if better, we better understand the role of clouds quite a bit. If clouds are actually working to keep the planet, there's reasons to think that in a world with humans and pollution and so on, there's going to be more clouds. If overall the role of human activity is to make more clouds and clouds keep the planet cooler, well, we kind of have something kind of helping balance the whole global warming thing. On the other hand, if the role of clouds keeping is to keep the world a little bit warmer, we have a serious problem. We're making a warmer planet and we've got the clouds working to keep us warm. This is a serious problem. We'll learn about the resolution of that problem mm, towards the end of the course when we do that module. So, so far in this first lecture about heat, we've seen about well, first we talked about conduction, convection, advection, and so on as ways of moving heat, but we found that for the point of view of meteorology and understanding temperatures and so on, we really needed to understand radiation and the radiation laws and the different types of radiation that were out there. We learned about all the things that could happen when radiation hits an object, be that object the food in your microwave oven or uh, you when you're sitting outside trying to get a tan 
or a cloud, or the atmosphere, or the ozone layer, or the surface of the Earth, or a snowbank, or whatever. And then we learned about the radiation budget. Once we understood how radiation moved through different materials, we could talk about, well, what is actually determining whether the temperature goes up or goes down at any given time. Like, during the day, when there's more shortwave net than there is longwave net, the temperature goes up. At night, when there's no shortwave uh, radiation, but there's still emission of radiation by longwave, we lose more heat than we gain, and the temperature goes down. All right, we've seen all these things. Now, it may not seem like all that much, but we do have two little things left to talk about that end up taking another whole lecture. One is what's determining the amount of shortwave radiation coming down from the sky. This is this whole business of needing to understand how um, the length of day and how high in the sky the sun gets and your latitude and the day of the year and so on. And then the second thing we need still to talk about is what's going to determine the amount of long wave down that's coming from the sky, which is going to be about greenhouse gases and so on. All right, but before we move on, because I know you need a break after a very long lecture like this, let's do a couple quick more questions here. Question 10. Some of the radiation emitted by the surface of the Earth is associated with the so-called atmospheric window. This radiation will be A, transmitted through the atmosphere, B, absorbed by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, C, reflected by clouds back to the Earth, or D, absorbed by ozone in the stratosphere. That atmosphere, you know, the Earth emits radiation in it. It's at a range of wavelengths. Some of it, though, is in that atmosphere, is in the range of wavelengths that we call the atmospheric window. What happens to radiation if it happens to be in that range? Take a look at those four options and make a choice. Get a little feedback before you move on to question 11.